Is that a psychological condition? What makes a young man living like that? Chronic fatigue syndrome, myalgic encephalomyelitis, in short MECFS, what the heck is this? And why are we talking about if this is a type of depression, burnout, conversion disorder, anxiety disorder, being female disorder and so on? Stay tuned because we're going to settle this question here once and for all. Okay, the first thing you have to know is that there have been several outbreaks of chronic fatigue syndrome in the last century and probably before, but it hasn't been classified and recorded accordingly. The first recorded outbreak was in 1934 in Los Angeles. Then, after an outbreak in London's Royal Free Hospital in 55, it was given the name myalgic encephalomyelitis. Under this designation, which seemed justified by autopsy studies and, by the way, more recent brain studies, it was coded under neurological diseases by the World Health Organization in 1969. So, here we go. Let's see what we can do with such a bulky term. After the village incline outbreak in 1984, it was given the name chronic fatigue syndrome. So why was that? Probably because they found out it was a psychological condition, right? No, because for outsiders, I mean those who have never had this illness, the main symptom of post-viral fatigue is, you name it, fatigue. And so the famous magazine Hippocrates ran a cover story, which was named Regedy N Syndrome, to note the fatigue and loss of muscle power patients felt. Reggie DN, by the way, for those who don't know it, was the main character of a children's book series. Reggie DN, a doll, which comes to life when nobody is around. Just think about the implication. Was modeled on a doll that the author had created for his daughter who died at the age of 13 and then of course patented it in 1915. Anyway, researchers investigating the Le Tahoe outbreak searched for a virus but didn't find any evidence for it. They searched for Epstein-Barr virus. And so they proposed the name chronic fatigue syndrome as they thought it was the main symptoms of the disease. So, if they didn't find any virus and the lab test showed normal, it must be psychological, right? Just wait a minute. Correct diagnosis. Quite apart from the fact that fatigue isn't the main symptom of the disease, for that is the deterioration of the overall condition after any form of exertion called post-exertional malaise, nor need it be a symptom of ME at all. One should always stick to the logic of the argument. And I'm often amazed how many doctors can't cope with simple logic. So, uh, we start abstract and then I will fill it with life, at least a bit. The point here is that two assertions called premises should lead to a logical conclusion. We are talking only about the validity of an argument, not if the premises are true. So, first abstract. If premise A, then premise B. If not A, therefore not B. These arguments are a typical mistake when we say they didn't find anything in the hospital so it's mental. This really gives me headaches. These are invalid arguments. This fallacy is also called an inverse error. 
It has the property that all premises are true, but they don't lead to the conclusion. Okay, now I'll give you an example. If technical diagnostic examinations of John Doe in Hospital Plain Villa show something, then he has a physical illness. Technical diagnostic examinations of John Doe in Hospital Plain Villa didn't show anything. Therefore, John Doe has no physical illness. This is an invalid argument because the reasoning is flawed. The truth of the premises does not lead to the conclusion here. Or in other words, the conditional statement just says that John has a physical illness if the exams in hospital play Miller show something. It does not say anything about what is the case if they don't. John could still have a physical illness because maybe in this hospital they couldn't test this illness. To clarify, I'm not saying that the conclusion as an examination result is bad in medical terms because invalid argument can give us good reason to believe in the claim. So it's still possible that John has a psychosomatic illness, but they don't guarantee this result. And this is what the message of this video can only be about. It's that you have to take a closer look, especially if your diagnosis is based on an invalid conclusion. In my opinion, psychosomatic and all psychiatric diagnosis should only be made by professionals such as psychosomatic doctors and psychologists. That's why I want to talk with someone who has much more expertise in this field than I have. Mein Name ist Cassandra Cicero. Ich bin klinische und Gesundheitspsychologin und wenn ich Diagnostik mache, dann mache ich das einfach im Gespräch. Ja? Ich sehe die Leute tatsächlich über Monate. Prinzipiell hat man ein Diagnosehandbuch, das ICD-10, und ich, man hat halt im Kopf ein Diagnoseschema und wenn so und so und so, so viele Punkte zutreffen, und bestimmte andere Sachen ausgeschlossen sind, würde man sagen, okay, das ist wahrscheinlich eine Depression. Nur weil ein Hausarzt irgendwas sagt, nehme ich das genauso wenig für voll wie sonst, wenn es wer sagt. Ich möchte wissen, welche Untersuchungen wurden gemacht. Gab es Blut, es gab es Röntgen, gab es Muskelbiopsien? Warum sollte überhaupt eine psychische Störung entstehen? Woher käme denn eine somatoforme Störung? Bei einer somatoformen Störung kann ich nie sicher sagen, dass es das ist, weil einfach die Medizin nicht so weit ist, dass sie alles ausschließen kann. Es ist halt schon so, dass wenn ein normaler Bluttest und ein Röntgen und keine Ahnung, ein EKG nichts ergeben, dann kann es ja nur psychisch sein, das ist so der Stand der Allgemeinmediziner. Und selbst dann, naja, die sind arbeitsfähig, ja, 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 die können alles machen, die haben keine Einschränkungen. Ich habe eigentlich nur, wenn eine Rolle zu helfen, dass sie verarbeiten, dass sie jetzt eine so schwere und bisher nicht heilbare Krankheit haben, und kann unterstützen bei sowas wie Pacing zu üben und zu lernen, ja. Aber ich kann nicht wirklich viel machen, ja. Dass sie lernen, ihre Grenzen zu erkennen und nicht drüber hinwegzugehen. Und das macht es vielleicht dann ein bisschen besser, aber nicht signifikant. Also nicht wie wenn du ein Medikament gibst und das wirkt, ja. But false psychosomatic diagnosis and especially gaslighting based on invalid conclusions can cause two ME patients. I would like to hear from someone who has experienced exactly this issue. I'm Lisa. I'm 36 years old. I've been diagnosed with ME-CFS four years ago, even though I had symptoms for about 10 years. I've also had a neurologist at the beginning, whom I went to with the diagnosis, who said, um, actually, what you're telling me right now, or what you've been diagnosed with, is totally based on self-description. You could tell me anything. There is no proof in your blood. There are no markers anywhere. You could also tell me that you see great green elephants standing around me. Um, and you've obviously, you are obviously sitting in front of me, so you can't be that ill. You look healthy. You're young. Um, and he said, I've seen too many young women in your age being falsely diagnosed with something like MS. I'm not accepting this. Uh, you have a, you obviously have a 
psychiatric illness, you need to go to the psychiatric ward or I will not continue working with you. Now I, I've experienced this a bit more, so now I would know what to answer him. But then I was shocked, couldn't say anything. I stood up and left and then broke out in tears because I doubted myself. I doubted the diagnosis. I doubted the symptoms I had. You know, I was, oh my God, he's a doctor, he must be right. Maybe I'm, but well, and then I was panicking because I thought what would happen to me in a psychiatric ward that I wouldn't, I would have to leave bedbound if they would send me there. I could still, could still walk a bit. I could, was basically a housebound as I am now, but I was panicking about what would happen to me in such a ward. Um, so it, it was horrible. It was a horrible experience not being believed. Well, he just, yeah, basically told me I was being a hysterical young woman, as he had seen so many others before. And it was crushing. Yeah. There are more errors in diagnostics, not to mention the vague and often very bad criteria we have. I want to come back to logic for a moment. Don't fall asleep, only for a moment. And I have a guest, and I want to know from him what issues there are. I'm Vlad Wexler. I am a political uh, philosopher, and I have lived with ME, myalgic encephalomyelitis, for about 18 or 19 years. I have probably seen about 100 doctors in four or five different countries over the last 18 years. And most of that experience is obviously very, very disappointing. For the average doctor, one of the problems is that there is a tendency to assume that just because a simple blood count has come back not showing anything wrong with a patient, that therefore there isn't anything wrong with a patient. So it's a kind of mistake of confusing um, absence of evidence with evidence of absence. But it's worse than this, because it's not just that we are in a situation where many doctors are confusing absence of evidence with evidence of absence. It's that we actually do have a great deal of evidence. What do you think? Drop me a line in the comments. And if you like the video, please give me a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. I'm out.